Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so just, you know, we, we will record this session and um, uh, potentially make it available later on, on YouTube. Um, so thank you very much, everyone, for, for joining. Um, I am uh, um, the co-chair of the FANG Frankfurt branch. Um, I've been with FANG for, I think, about eight years mostly with the New York branch. Um, my uh, professional experience is in the finance and mostly in the FP&A areas. I worked mm -hmm. at um, Deutsche Bank, AIG, uh, AGI, Allianz Global Investors, so uh, major financial institutions. And uh, lately I uh, managed uh, the entire uh, scope, I would say, of FP&A processes. Um, I would say I have innovated quite a bit over the years, and this is exactly the purpose of this presentation. Uh, now, I have left the corporate world and I launched my own startup that focuses actually on uh, um, uh, workplace topics. So it's it's something quite different. Um, but, um, you know, I... I as the co-chair, you know, uh, it, it's good to have meetings and share information. And this was something that is my life's work. And I felt it's a good time also in early in the year to uh, uh, share some insights and uh, maybe uh, uh, let you guys uh, ask, answer some questions at the end. Um, this is uh, definitely, I think, still a very important, very critical area, fp &A, to me is in the center of every uh, uh, business, especially every large business. Um, and it sort of, yeah, it's the place where a lot of things come together. So I would definitely say it is, uh, uh, it's a good place to be. I, I loved being in fp &A in the center of things, but it also is a responsibility um, where the organization actually relies quite a lot on the FPNA function, especially when it comes to your, um, you know, variance analytics, to your forecasting, and uh, to the strategic planning exercises. So these are the keys, um, um, the key areas. So let me jump into um, the presentation. I will actually share my screen, um, and I will do it as a slideshow. So hopefully that works. Um, okay, so um, the presentation, I am hoping it will take me about half an hour to go through it. Um, and then we will have some time for questions and answers um, at the end. Um, if I, I would say if, you know, it would probably be best for the format of this if you could uh, hold your questions until the end um, and then we will cover them. And then afterwards, I will be happy to connect with you individually if you have any further questions uh, or would like to pick my brain or mm -hmm. um, run something by me. So, um, okay, the agenda, um, we advertised four items. I actually realized when preparing the presentation that I wouldn't have enough time for the workplace planning. Um, so I apologize for that. If you were really counting on that uh, subject, I plan to make a separate um, presentation, a separate event out of it. But today we will focus on the basic variance analysis and commentary, then the forecasting and how they integrate, and then the planning process. Um, and I will share some tips of how to uh, run a global planning process in a multi-thousand people institution in six weeks, which I don't think many, many, <laughs> many FP&A teams uh, have been able to accomplish. Um, okay, variance analysis and commentary. So the question, what is the purpose of variance analysis and is it the same purpose as the commentary? I suggest that purpose of variance analysis is to understand, yeah? understand what is going on. This is why we're doing the analysis and variance is path to do it. 
Commentary is different. Commentary purpose is to explain. This is where we communicate what we found out uh, through our analysis to the target audience. Um, so a tip basically on this topic, I think it is important to understand the difference. And when you understand the difference, what it means is that these two are actually not the same process. Yeah, these two are actually um, two separate processes as far as I'm concerned. And what I would say is that uh, in order to produce a good commentary, you have to first do um, the variance analysis the right way. So what is the right way to do it? Okay, so um, I will introduce two techniques um, here to the variance analysis. So the first technique is the five whys. And I am sure you have heard about it, but it's good to reiterate it. It's actually one of the most powerful techniques, I would say, and it's something that is um, always exciting to think about, um, but it's also critical in the um, variance analysis, right? It comes from the Japanese wisdom, uh, basically where you, in order to get to the root cause, you have to ask why a number of times. And they believe that usually you can get to the right answer or the bottom answer after the fifth question. So for example, right? Why did the profit increase? Primarily, <laughs> the language we like to use are uh, mostly due to and, and so forth. Revenues increase, right? Is that an answer by itself? No, it's just a PL item that moved it, right? So this is not um, truly the underlying um, um, answer. So why did the revenues increase? Because interest revenues increase. So you're still basically you're zooming in on your drilling into your PL and you're like, okay, interest, you know, rather than fees uh, is what drove it. Okay, that's still not enough of an answer, right? Why did the interest increase? I mean, there's basically two options with interest, um, uh, you know, in, in normal course of um, business. Either the fees changed, or the interest uh, rates changed, or the volume changed, right? So, um, so in this case, let's say also <laughs> something that is very relevant to us today. Uh, the Fed raised the interest rate, so now we might be making uh, more money on uh, on the revenues. Yeah, plausibility check. Yeah, this is something I will actually talk about here in the tip. Yeah. When you're using, how do you know when to stop asking the questions? It's when you get to an answer that is both plausible and sufficient. Yeah. And this is usually an answer that cannot be interpreted or cannot be um, directly um, um, taken from your PL or from the SAP general ledger, whatever you use. Yeah. So it is the underlying um, driver. Um, that you want to get to. And this is where uh, basically the variance analysis should end uh, and give you enough information to think about it and then explain it. There is another technique that might be something that I uh, innovated. I mean, I've never really seen it done this way before, but I've used it for many years in several institutions. Um, yeah, so. Before we go there, you know, what is um, what is the typical problem with the way that we approach our commentaries, right? Month over month, quarter over quarter, year over year, uh, even actuals versus plan. The um, the the flaw of that tends to be that we actually treat commentaries on their own. Yeah, so we do a month over month commentary. And then we, when we move to the next month, we actually use that commentary as the basis for the next month commentary, sort of as a reference, right? And we end sort of um, a begin and end the process too much with the commentary. And what I suggest is that we should always begin the process with the uh, underlying drivers. And for that, uh, you know, we have to understand that the, the when we have a variance, three things, right? There could be a new item that just popped up. That's new information in the current period. 
It could be that there was an item in the prior period, which is old information that is no longer there. When you do a commentary, unless you explain which it is, it's not clear by itself whether this is new item or old item falling off. It could also be some sort of a project or some sort of an event that it kind of drags out over a number of months. So it is present in both periods, but the amount um, of its presence sort of changed. Um, yeah, and this is where it gets a bit tricky. And uh, this is where you also tend to run into quality risks, depending on who is doing it, because people might not even um, see or might not remember in many cases, depending how the process is set up, what happened last year. Yeah, so you're doing year over year and you actually might, um, you know, you might forget, especially if you're looking at the prior commentary, you might forget whether that event was actually part of the period you're comparing to or part of the period that was before that, yeah. So how did I solve this topic? Um, this, is a, this is a term that I coined, yeah, event-based variance analysis, um, EBVI. Um, what it does, yeah, it basically breaks down your entire PNL variance into broadly three types of uh, events or three types of drivers. Yeah? And I'm giving you options to use some uh, mnemonics or whatever abbreviations uh, as you like, but basically you have three types of activity that will explain um, any variance. Yeah, you have one-offs, one, one time items, unusual rare items that happen. This is actually where most of our variance analysis focuses on because you have a rather stable business. Um, you know, they, they, these are the things that will actually stick out. Yeah, there is a seasonality um, and seasonality, what I mean is usually a seasonality that recurs year to year. You have a pattern of benefits, for example, our social security benefits. Yeah, they tend to be very high January, February, then they sort of decrease because we run into the limits. If your company pays out bonuses in February, February will have a very high benefits number, um, you know, and uh, then basically uh, you're reaching the cap and then it falls off. Um, the same with travel expenses, for example, there's not a lot of travel around uh, August. Or, or Christmas time, you know, December, January, and then other months tend to be bigger. It helps to understand the seasonality of your business uh, because this, this is part of your commentary. Um, and by the way, business days, yeah, if, if your revenues are contingent on the business days, that's a big one. I, I, I think people still get shocked at how bad the February month always looks, especially, you know, January seems to be okay. Then February comes in three less uh, business days, plus, uh, you know, you get some benefits, hits and so forth. And suddenly you're questioning your, your plan. Yeah, because, um, and I've seen it happen many times, uh, but this is what uh, us as the FPNA function, um, uh, you know, should really understand and factor it into our commentary so we don't so panic. Uh, with our audiences. So seasonality is important. It also becomes important in strategic planning when you want to plan, for example, next year by month, you want to reflect that. You don't want to just take the full year number and then just divide it in 12, you know, equal for every month because then every month you will have enormous variances to plan, which will question your ability actually to do planning as an FPNA function. You don't want that. Seasonality is important. The third one is actually the most important of, of these ones. And I actually experienced it firsthand when we had the great uh, recession, 2007, 2008. If you remember 2007, there was a market crash. I think it was in August and I was in the asset management industry. So within a month, yeah, there was basically, um, when you looked at the revenues, and also because there were some, uh, um, you know, uh, calendar day differences, month over month variances, September to August or August to July, I don't remember which one exactly, 
wasn't that much. There was some movement. Yeah, there was a million, two million, some movement was there. But if you were actually um, paying attention, you would realize that what just happened is a baseline shift. The market crashed. It didn't fully crash. It was sort of the first crash. Then it kind of went back up and then it crashed again. But that small month of a month variance where you identify that something has changed in your business that is going to have a, an outsized impact on the future, on your run rate or baseline or however you call it, that I would say is the biggest thing uh, where FP&A um, a function can actually help the business see these things early. And this is what we did. I was at the time with, uh, uh, with DWS and we actually immediately took that into account and updated the outlook to reflect basically the sudden drop in the, uh, in the market, which affected our uh, revenue base and started thinking about what it would mean Whereas maybe some others were still sort of, you know, they're just kind of looking at the variance. It wasn't too bad. They wouldn't see it, um, you know, um, in, in full impact several months uh, until several, several months later. So this is an interesting thing. On a, on a uh, you know, more tangible or sort of easier cost related example, for, for example, if you have a long term lease, yeah, and that is a major leasing expense, is a major. Uh, expense for you and suddenly you know the lease ended and you renegotiated the new one and now your lease is 10 percent more expensive or 10 percent less expensive you know on a month-to-month -month basis in the variance you will see a very small piece of that but if you investigate you ask the whys you will get that basically you know let's say march in the first month when your new lease kicks in and that 10 percent now you have to factor it into the rest of the year forecast and into your baseline for the future, even though it may not be, it, it may barely register as a variance on a month to month, but it is important because you now have a different um, basically operating environment. Okay, so this is this, uh, yeah, so, um, what I'm suggesting here is basically to record these things. Don't uh, don't uh, allow for the commentary to become its own thing where commentary is what you use for reference. Have an Excel spreadsheet of these items. You know, record the one-offs because a year later you will forget what were the actual items a year before and you want to record them in full amounts in every month. Because when you do that, you can also do a normalized um, um, Analytics, you can actually do uh, you know, a view of your PL, excluding the one-offs, which everybody excludes mentally anyway, but very few functions actually have a mechanism to show a normalized view. And I will tell you, you will be surprised what it looks like. Once you take out the one-offs, now you start really questioning what is going on. It's it's a very, I would say, interesting technique to be able to normalize your PL and look at it. Um, it, on that basis. Yeah. Okay, um, so this is basically what I was saying. Uh, I would suggest that if you are using these techniques and if you incorporate them into how you do the analytics and the, um, the uh, commentary, it will actually um, increase the value of your FPNA function and um, also the efficiency and quality of your commentaries. You, know, you, you will not be losing things because something offset something. Um, and that is uh, always a good thing. Okay, forecasting. Um, projection versus prediction, forecast, right? So this was always an interesting thing. Sometimes, uh, you know, I, and I face the same as well from, from, from the business. Uh, you could miss a forecast by a lot, yeah. Uh, and uh, the question would be, okay, is there something wrong with what you were doing? Possibly, but not necessarily. Actuals are tricky, especially if you have an unstable environment. You will miss a forecast quite often. The point is that you should not be um, trying 
to predict the future. Yeah, this is where uh, you, you, you would probably make some shortcuts and some errors. So I would always suggest build the right forecast using the information you have, you know, run rate it out, project it, add the things that you know, do a scenario analysis much better, do a best case, worst case scenario for things that might happen, explain them, make them very clear to your audience, but don't be, uh, you know, don't be too uh, upset if you uh, miss um, uh, in the end, if your actuals come in different from the forecast, it does not take away from quality of the forecast. Things can happen. Like again, you know, with, with today's events, uh, this week's events uh, with the uh, market uh, reacting to uh, the bank fails uh, or, you know, a lot of things can happen. So uh, don't don't get frustrated or distracted, I would say, with that. Um, rolling forecast. Yeah, a lot of organizations are playing around with the idea of doing sort of a 12-month rolling. I basically have an advice that uh, don't do it. Uh, I would say focus on the forecast, which is the rest of the year forecast, because this is sort of the first priority anyway. Um, the second priority um, would be, uh, uh, you know, splitting up that forecast into the quarters or the month for the rest of the year, because there will always be a question, okay, what are we looking for next quarter <laughs> yeah, or next month? Uh, and then the, the final one is the exit run rate. People might come to you and ask, okay, what are we looking at in terms of our run rate going into the next year, especially as you approach sort of a half year mark? The the twelve month forecast. If you were doing one now that goes into the March of next year, that first quarter of next year is basically a waste of time. Yeah, and this is what I would suggest: push back on that. <laughs> Give them a good rest of the year forecast. Do it by month. Incorporate the seasonality and and um, you know uh, what you know. Give them the scenarios. Give them the exit run rate, but push back on the on the rolling forecasts. Um, I, I don't see any value in that. Okay, forecasting versus planning. You know, what is the difference? And we are transitioning towards the, the planning um, uh, part of the presentation. So forecast, when I say forecasting, I usually mean rest of the year. So like now is March, I would be forecasting probably the uh, 2023 so we have now february actuals we have two months of actuals we are in the middle of march we can already incorporate some uh, market drivers and and so forth and uh, we can still use uh, you know some planning assumptions but i would say the first forecast first quarter forecast a lot of companies tend to keep it very close to their plan because the plan probably just sort of got their final sign off in January. <laughs> so uh, it's a practical matter that you don't want to basically spend too much. But I would say, you know, check on the market. Yeah, check on your key assumptions, because if you are off on the market or on, the, on your revenues for some reason or something happened that is a material difference, you at least should mention it and discuss it with the business management. Yeah, let them decide what they want to do with it, uh, but they should know, and you should be the one who brings it up. So difference, obviously, planning is your strategic plan. It usually covers three to five years, sometimes the first year of that planning period. So in this case would be 2024, might be referred to as budgeting because it tends to get more granular. It's where you kind of, um, I usually uh, want to do it by month, so you can do a you know month over month that actuals versus budget or plan variances next year. Um, but in general, it is a strategic exercise. It, it has a three to five years uh, forecasting should be done quickly. Planning takes time. Often forecasting, yeah, we used to do it every quarter, um, so three forecasts a year basically. Planning. It's an annual process. Sometimes companies will break it up if they have, I would say, a rather inefficient uh, process or sort of not a very deep understanding of the seasonality. Uh, many of them will do something in April, May, 
and then they will kind of sit on it and then they'll do something you know after the second quarter closes and everybody will be surprised by by the changes but the only thing that really changed in most cases is the market so it's just a few drivers and you don't need to redo the entire plan for that but um anyway um yeah forecast usually you you kind of stick first forecast might be basically sticking with the plan but then second forecast and third one you really switch to the realistic sort of bottoms up view of what finance believes uh, will happen based on things that were already approved or already in progress so if you have an initiative that hasn't kicked off and you're in September I mean you're not going to hire anybody until next year so there's no point dragging these things into the forecast planning on the other hand is supposed to be a very comprehensive holistic um, uh, sort of um, approach to the strategic initiatives you, you're doing the SWOT analysis you're doing kind of market benchmarking you, you're looking at the uh, uh, you know at you know if you have a parent company what what is parent demanding what what the market demands what competitors are doing and so forth <laughs> And it becomes a combination of the two. Um, yeah. And I think this is the point of the differences here. Okay. Planning process. The, uh, the interesting part. Who owns the planning process? Um, in my experience, um, ultimately, it is the business that was the formal owner of the plan. I worked also in organizations where the CEO would co-own the plan with the CFO. So obviously when that happens, then the finance function becomes more of a, uh, of a player, yeah, more of a side to the actual um, uh, uh, planning process. Um, in the end, it doesn't matter, I would say that much. And I will explain why. So, and this is, what does it mean for finance? Yeah. In any case, finance has at least two roles when it comes to the planning process. And the first role is actually coordinating, designing, and managing the planning process. And nobody will do it for you unless you have a very weak FP&A function, then usually business management or CO function will step into your turf and try to do it. And I would hope that that doesn't happen. So especially after this presentation that you know how to do it. I always took uh, ownership of the uh, planning process um, when I was leading the FBNA. Uh, there was just no question. Um, and um, um, and I, I would say that that was a very fortunate place to be. That's kind of where you want to be as the leader of the planning process with the understanding that ultimately, for example, the business approvals of the different initiatives, they are a business prerogative, even though finance uh, will act in their second role, which is the control function. Um, so control function is where um, you are supposed to challenge the business. Finance is supposed to challenge the business um, to make sure that they don't, uh, uh, you know, shortcut the, the, the planning process and they don't sort of jeopardize or risk organizational resources on initiatives that have no um, uh, solid financial uh, basis for them. Yeah. So you're both leading the process, but you're also um, a sparring partner and a challenger. You, you are in the um, uh, role basically protecting the shareholders uh, and sort of a control function, you want to ensure that there is a good quality to the uh, ultimate plan and all the plan components. Um, if, if the CFO co-owns the budget, then you will probably just take on a bit more of the role of the ownership and you might have more tasks um, validating the initiatives um, or, or you know, doing some scenario now. There may be more potentially more interesting work as well with some of the um, M&A transactions or whatnot. So, but this is a good space to be, and it's important to, I would say, to understand and own both of these um, um, functions uh, for the FP&A team. 
Okay. Top down or bottom up? Um, I uh, the I would say the most uh, frustrating planning processes uh, that I ever took over were very much bottoms up uh, planning processes where you know the the planning was done at the core center level. Every you know owner, thousands of people, uh, you know ADP and up, who anybody who owned the core center they would be given full responsibility to sit there and plan out their cost center, even if it's you know, $10,000, $100,000 rounding error. And then the finance would basically sit there and wait for the data to come back. And data would be completely yeah, inconsistent, very poor quality, horrible, horrible. <laughs> and I actually inherited one of those processes at, at some time and I completely changed it. Um, so. I believe that, I mean, if your system allows core center level uh, uh, planning or forecasting, and I will show you what I mean, if it allows, it's okay. Yeah, because it's ultimately, this is where the numbers are. If uh, your system doesn't allow that, or there is no cost benefit to doing that, I would suggest picking a level in the middle, which is basically a business unit a meaningful business unit, a function, maybe a, a geography, and sort of make very clear uh, what these are to make sure they don't overlap and you don't miss anything. So you, you want to break down the entire p &L into these units and then make sure you have uh, acceptance within the organization of who actually owns which piece. But that's sort of a middle ground where you are doing it meaningfully enough with enough participation where you need it but without overwhelming the system and the organization with sort of meaningless, you know, it's make it uh, 1,200 instead of 1,100 type of activity. Um, I've also been part of organizations where the top-down uh, budgeting was uh, very much in favor. Um, I would say in those cases, even if the uh, business already has top-down targets in mind, or even if uh, the parent company, for example, provides uh, an expected um, profit target for your division uh, for the next five years. The exercise should not be to allocate that to everybody, yeah, because you're going to miss a very important opportunity and you're going to actually incur a lot of risks doing that. It's not very difficult to do a technical allocation of anything down to any level. Yeah, the question is, how meaningful is that? And I would say it's not meaningful at all. So what I would encourage, and I've done it every time on my own initiative, if I had to, as an FPNA function, I would still run the, the full planning process, potentially without a few things, but I would run it <laughs> and I would actually show the gaps to the business of between my sort of bottom-up view and the top-down target. And I would just bring it up to them and say, hey, you know what, you have a hundred million gap here on the revenues. How do you plan to close it? Because in the end, the, the, you know, the, the purpose of the planning exercise is not just to assign targets that are impossible to reach. The business needs to understand what, what they want to do and they need to figure out a way realistically to do it. Yeah, maybe with a bit of a stretch, but it should not be just, I mean, you can't really sign off on a planning process that has no realistic way to get to the numbers. That to me would be actually a, a abdication uh, uh, you know, of the finance responsibility as a control function. So um, that would be uh, my recommendation to always do uh, a bottom-up plan anyway. And, uh, if you have top-down targets, then you bring them together and you identify the gaps as the first step. Um, now we're going to actually look at what makes up a good plan. Yeah? And I presume you guys know this, but maybe you haven't quite uh, seen it particularly this way. So we'll go through the, uh, the layers, what I call the layers of the plan. So everything starts with the baseline. Um, I give you an acronym if you like. Uh, BOR, uh, Base Operating Run Rate, 
normalized run rate, you know, base run rate, exit run rate. I mean, there are different names. What it means is what would be the projection or what would be the, the forecast uh, or the plan without any initiatives. Yeah, so we are basically, we keep doing what we're doing. Everything stays still. The market doesn't move, nothing moves. You know, what are we looking at? And who owns that finance? Yeah, why? Because we know the data. So it is up to us to actually uh, do that actually as part of that variance analysis exercise. That's why I bring this up here in, in the small font. The way you do it, basically, the best, the easiest way to do it is take the year-to-date actuals and then basically subtract your SOBs, your, your one-offs, your um, uh, seasonality factors or normalize for them, let's say, because sometimes it's plus, sometimes it's minus, and then incorporate the baseline shifts so that you get actually a run rate and then you have an annualized run rate that then you can actually apply forward. Um, uh, that is very valuable. Yeah, everybody will always want to know what their run rate is, and this is how you do it. And then for the plan organic growth, right? So depending on the type of business you're in, you will have some drivers, market drivers, uh, transaction drivers, interest rate drivers. Um, you know, um, um, you know what does what drives your business? Customer drivers. Uh, you know, depending on the business, you should know them. Yeah, you should identify what they are and you should actually understand how they work, how they impact the business and you should build them as a separate layer that goes on top of the baseline. So if somebody's projecting, if you're projecting that equity markets will go up 5% next month, then that is a driver, 5% up. If you project that the compensation cost will go up 3%, then that is an organic growth driver, but it has to be... Uh, you know, it, it has to be built separately so that you can also deconstruct your plan into these drivers. So it's not just one number, basically, and then nobody knows where that number came from. Do it as layers, literally in Excel, different templates layered on to the same um, PL or the same business uh, PL, um, sort of like literally like layers. Um, Operational initiatives, right? There's two types of initiatives generally, operational, strategic. Um, there's the only difference between them, I would say, is the way that we approach it is that operational initiatives, they, they can either be mandatory, sort of regulatory, you know, mandatory upgrade, something you have to do, basically, no matter what. Um, or you could have also uh, optimization initiatives where somebody wants to reallocate resources from one place to another. And the hallmark of those um, initiatives would be uh, that they're self-funded. Yeah, the mandatory ones, you will want to push the business to fund all operational initiatives, self-fund. Find something to fund them. Because, why? Because if, if an initiative requires separate funding, yeah, then that should be considered actually uh, strategic initiative it's an investment case yeah and you have to have uh, you have to help business make that case whoever is presenting it to the ceo ultimately depending on the size the ceo might have to make that business case to the board or to whoever so it's important to distinguish because of operational initiatives usually would be approved within the business within just the exco um, and it's okay yeah, strategic initiatives usually will have broader implications, but they also would tend to be a lot bigger. They're strategic. Yeah, it could be opening a new uh, business um, or a new office or, you know, buying um, a competitor or, or doing something like that. Yeah. Um, okay, our favorite stretch, stretch target stop size. Generally, I don't think you can avoid it. I mean, if you're lucky, I was lucky a few years when our budget or our planning process produces produced results from the finance baseline and from the business heads or their CEOs at the business level that essentially gave us the target or gave us the plan um, number that the uh, executives were happy with. So there was nothing to do. In many cases, there would be these gaps, 
where they would like to do more. There will be a negotiation process with the people to see if somebody would actually commit to that or take on that stretch target. In the end, if that doesn't happen, um, then um, these would be basically top level targets uh, or top sites, and they are okay because things will change, things will happen. They will get operationalized um, you know, over the course of the year. I mean, obviously, if half your profit is a top site, <laughs> I would say as a finance function, uh, you might have to speak up. Yeah, I, I, I don't see how that is okay. But if you are top siding 10%, you know, something like that, I think in general, that, that 5 10% would not be um, an issue. Um, up down scenarios. So once you're done with the actual plan, plan building, I mean, obviously there will be a lot of variability, a lot of fluctuation in everything you do. Every initiative will have an upside, a downside, theoretically. Market can have upside, downside. So I would definitely suggest that finance, even if you're not requested to do it, that you just attempt to do it. I mean, you could do it at the very small level and say, okay, what if market crashes 25% or what if it grows 25%? Usually it's the worst case that people are interested in, but best case as well, uh, it's interesting for them to have sort of a range in their mind because it, it may affect certain things uh, in terms of requesting funding and financing and so forth. So it's definitely always, uh, I would consider it a mandatory part of the planning process. You should have scenarios um, presented, yeah, prepared and presented um, as part of it. Okay, so as you can see, in terms of the ownership, um, yeah, basically finance is the owner of, um, of three of these. Yeah, in the middle, the initiatives, and I will actually, next slide will show it. Business is the owner of the initiatives because it's their initiatives, but finance really can make a big difference by simplifying the, the templates and automating the templates to remove the unnecessary um, sort of um, uncertainty from the business as to how much things cost. Yeah, because everybody has tends to have very wildly different ideas as to how much it costs to hire a VP salesperson in London or IT salesperson in uh, you know whatever a programmer in in uh, you know San Francisco. But you know because you have the access to the uh, or HR nodes. Um, but depending on your cost center granularity, you probably know on average, how much people costs uh, in, in different places, in different roles. And um, this is definitely what we should do. Uh, okay, template. Yeah, this is what I'm talking about. So I definitely recommend to make a template that is very comprehensive, includes all the lines that actually initiatives should be impacting. These are your compensation, revenue, obviously compensation, non-comps, don't forget the travel, the marketing occupancy charges. And then at the end, the support functions. Don't forget that if it's a big initiative, it will place some demands on the support functions. So support functions might want to uh, target for it. What I did is actually, I would actually, um, um, you know, um, collect this information um, from basically in more of a yes or no format uh, from the business, uh, whether they feel they need the support <laughs> from the uh, support functions. Uh, but then I would share the templates with the support functions and let them actually um, think about it. Yeah, let them know what the support functions are, what, what the initiatives are, have them come back with it. Yeah, it, it, it's usually a point that is missed and it takes a lot of the uh, tension away going forward when somebody said, well, you never told me you were going to open an office. I need to put the you know, compliance person there, but I have no budget. So you're covering that. Make sure you cover that here. And it's, it's an easy way to do it. Um, yeah, so this is just finance instructions. Yeah, so again, the way I did it, you see here, headcount. Yeah, I basically did drop downs. And I link the drop-down selections to average data 
um, that you may have access to or you may need to get from HR um, and basically where it would only require um, a, a role, number of headcounts, um, function, for example, sales function should trigger travel expense. But if it's an IT or finance or compliance function, internal function, then there is no uh, travel, but there's probably uh, uh, some data costs, you know, licenses for different uh, products that, that people have to have access to. So you need to know how uh, pricing works. Uh, the, your business doesn't have to know that if they can just select three drop downs and get the number that is average, fine, you know, they're done. If you give them a blank template like this, they will sit on it for three months. Yeah, and you will get complete nonsense back. So definitely automate these templates as much as possible. Now we are almost done. And I know I kind of went a bit over the, the half an hour. So I'm not going to go through all the words here, but this is basically, I'm showing you how to run a strategic planning process in six weeks. And I broke it up into the six weeks and I will just go through the, the, the headlines um, for these things. So before you kick, before you formally start the process, obviously you need to plan for it. And yeah, that's your week zero. Week one, you can actually do two things in parallel, but this is where you are sending out the templates and you start building your baselines. Um, week two is when you start to collect and validate information. Yeah, it's, it needs to be condensed. But if your templates are well done, people don't need weeks and months to sit on them. Yeah, they can literally build a template and there should be a finance business partner assigned to every business unit and they should help their business build these things. Yeah, literally take the, the information from them as to how many people where, plug it in and uh, check with them and be done with it. Initiatives building should not take more than uh, actually a total of a week. And this is what we're counting on if the initiative templates are done in a highly automated, reasonable fashion. So week three is already when you're pulling everything together. Week four is when you should have scheduled meetings with the business leaders where you are presenting all the information that comes from your baseline plus their initiatives. Yeah, what it would actually look like. You run it with the CEO and the executive team before these meetings. So they have an idea whether they need to stretch more or whether they need to sort of clamp down on the costs uh, uh, or, or whatnot. So they go into the meetings already knowing these things, but the purpose of the meetings ultimately is to approve initiatives. Yeah, so they will actually come out of it and you will participate in these meetings. I participate with a list of, you know, from the 60 operating initiatives and 20 strategic initiatives how many were approved. And these are the ones that you basically incorporate into the plan and the other ones, you just set them aside. Yeah, and again, think about the layers. So each initiative comes in a separate Excel spreadsheet or if you're using fancy planning programs, it has it, it should have its own thing, you know, but then it, it integrates into the numbers sort of as a layer. And then week five is basically when you pull all of that together yeah, and you do sort of a last validation, uh, review it with the C senior leadership exco, make sure they're fine with the overall numbers, make for their final adjustments. And that's it, week six, you load the plan data into your system or, you know, finalize the presentation, send it out and you're done. Um, okay, and the tip is basically what I said, preparation is key. Uh, make sure you you uh, incorporate all your key uh, plan deliverables, especially again if you're part of a you know larger conglomerate with a parent, they will have their deadlines. They will also have their um, particular um, data points potentially. Yeah, and um, uh, yeah, and uh, baselining. Yeah, make sure you do the baselining on your own initiatives. Keep it simple in terms of the templates and just manage it um, like that. So one last topic before we uh, 
and the presentation is what to do with the cost allocations. Yeah, there are internal cost allocations, external. Uh, what do I mean just to be on the same page? In many organizations, in terms of internal cost allocations, you have basically a separation between the products or the, the revenue generating uh, units and the cost units. Yeah, so you may have a product like a equity division or institutional division in asset management that are selling to the institutional clients or you know selling equity products. And then you have finance function, IT compliance, even marketing, all of these are cost functions that need to be cleared out and loaded technically into the business units. You know, A, so you have some look at profitability, which I would say is not particularly helpful in most cases because you take, you're making a lot of assumptions as to the allocations. But the point is when it comes to planning, um, don't, uh, don't, um, don't feel like you have to build an internal cost allocation mechanism and clear out every iteration of the plan for six weeks. Yeah, no point. Why? Because it's a left pocket, right pocket. Yeah, the actual costs of these functions, finance, marketing, IT, everything, the actual direct costs are budgeted as part of your baseline and your initiatives. It's just a clear out. Yeah, it's just uh, removing them and placing them somewhere else using some allocation metrics. So I would say, keep it simple. Don't let this process delay anything in the planning process, but you could have a simplified allocation metrics. You could apply it depending on your system, whether you're doing it Excel or in, in a particular tool. I mean, if it's simple, it's just push the button, you can do it. But the first time I, I, I took over a, a function, actually, this was the thing that was taking actually the most time. And uh, it was it was taking days to rerun at the cost center level. They were doing it in a massive Excel, rerunning all the allocations. And the entire organization was waiting for three, four, five days as the guys, you know, analysts were burning midnight oil, um, trying to get the Excel to work. I killed it. That was my first decision when I took over. I killed that thing. And we never saw it again. Yeah, because it was just, uh, a horrible, horrible idea. And that saved us probably half the time of the planning process right there. External cost allocations, what does it mean? Usually if you are part of a bigger group, yeah, there might be centralized functions that are allocating to you, the headquarters, the management board, some kind of a centralized, uh, you know, top level um, uh, headquarters, uh, you know, finance function, compliance, they usually have these functions they allocate to you. Yeah, it's part of your planning process. You have to tie to these things, yeah? So all you need to do is figure out when the, you are getting the data. For practical purposes, I always, if I don't get the data early enough, I would just assume that these costs stay the same. And then as soon as I get the data that same day, I will go to my executive uh, committee, uh, the business leaders, and I will tell them, hey, you know what? Your service providers came in 10 million higher than we projected. Uh, 10 million higher than, than uh, you know, this year. And then it, uh, depending on the setup and the dynamic, they could go and challenge it. We could go and ask questions at least, why are they higher? Um, you know, usually it's, it's kind of, it is what it is in the end. If you are a division, you just take it, yeah? But if you have a profit target and this suddenly opened the gap of 10 million, let's say to your profit target, well, that is the point where you need to potentially um, find another 10 million to, to close the gap, yeah? Or you could enter the, um, uh, the top side in that case, assuming that, hey, you know what, they always project, you know, a 10% increase, but it never happens. So depending on the setup, you can, you could do that. Um, okay, this is actually it. So, um, I am going to stop the presentation here um, and open this up for questions. And if you need me to bring it back up and go to some slide, please do that. So what do you guys think? Any, any questions? Um, did this make you think about anything or is this basically how you are doing this and there's nothing new in what I just presented?
That's a very well defined structure, uh, Demi. I think it picks up a lot of the elements of of my work experience and practice, but it's great to see it pulled together in a comprehensive manner. So I think it's a great go to template for anybody to digest before they set off on a forecasting or planning process. And uh, I think it's a it's a great discipline. Thank you. Yeah. I certainly certainly agree. The uh, the formalization, the organization of things like the the BOS breakdown. Uh, that's and then to be able to have that uh, uh, carry that through consistently throughout whatever scope of your responsibility is. Uh, you know, that's that's an interesting and a, uh, I think very very good way to organize it. Thank you very much. For some. Anybody else? Any questions or any more uh, thoughts on this? Yes, when you were talking about one of the, the Excel sheets you had, you were talking about before you send it out, have drop downs. But I didn't really follow that, that chat that you had up where you were saying, instead of leaving it blank, give them drop downs so you could get it back much better. Can you just talk more about that? That one I didn't really follow. Yeah, uh, thank you, Marilyn. So what I what I mean is that if your initiatives are um, captured in an Excel template, right, and you would generally have all your elements there that you need to capture over time, you know, um, however you define your forecasting process. Um, in many companies, um, uh, uh, many processes, what I've seen is that basically finance would create these templates, but would leave them blank and would just send them out completely blank, meaning there are no formulas, no data reference, nothing. Yes. Yeah? So what it means is that whoever is filling in the impact of their initiatives that they're proposing, they basically have to type in every single number. And this is where I found a lot of discrepancies and a lot of noise and a lot of confusion on the business side where somebody will forget okay. that it costs money, for example, to rent a cubicle for people. Yeah, they just don't consider, they, they would just focus on compensation. They would also forget about the bonuses. Yeah, if you have bonuses, they would definitely forget that there is a compliance function that ne is needed for any new office, for example, right? And this is where we are as finance, we can actually help them uh, to basically, what I did is I actually, on the top of the template in Excel, I basically had three rows where of four rows with drop downs. What do I mean drop downs? So first, the first drop down is what type of function you are hiring for. Yeah. And this would be actually multi tab templates for the same initiative. So one initiative would have several tabs, and each tab would be specific to a particular uh, um, uh, fire, you know, specific um, uh, uh, function. So if you want to have an initiative that requires 10 salespeople, two marketing people, you know, three accountants, four compliance people, you will actually have four different templates within that initiative. And there will be a summary that aggregates the four templates. But in the drop down, you go to the sales, you will actually have a drop down option from finance where you just select, okay, I need sales, then I need five people. How many headcount? Five. Yeah. And then basically which region, okay, London or whatever, however your structure is, um, yeah, and uh, what level, yeah? So you could actually have say, okay, this is a VP level or director level. And what then happens is based on these drop downs, <laughs> your template will actually, you know, pre-populate the numbers based on the averages that you see in your company. Uh, yeah, so based on the existing averages of what it costs to have at a VP level salesperson in London, yeah. So I didn't, you know, present it sort of in its full complexity, but this is the idea. And what I'm suggesting is that the more you do on the finance side, the more you simplify these things so people can literally go in and just basically drop down a couple of things. They will have to enter revenues. You can't predict revenues. They'll have to do it. But other than that, the entire cost section should ideally be pre-filled as soon as they select whom they want to hire. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So does that answer your question, Marilyn?
Yes, thank you. All right. Hey, Jimmy, this is Ian. I think you've sketched a great picture of what a world-class planning process would look like. I just have one comment where I would like to see what you think about it. And that is what I miss a little bit is a, is a robust challenge process between the business and the service providers based on supply and demand. For example, if you take the, the HR services provided to the business or the finance services, I don't think you should just accept that. I think there should be some moment in your planning process where you give the business the opportunity to, to in a robust way, challenge what they receive. I think one, it, 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 it creates a good tension around costs. And I think secondly, it makes transparent to the business what they're paying for. So maybe yeah. that's something that's implicit in your system, but I, I just missed a little bit that opportunity for the business to actually challenge the cost that's get allocated to them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> very interesting topic. Uh, thank you very much, Ian, for, for bringing this up. I've actually, uh, you know, I, I, I've been in, in situations with businesses that, that deal with this differently. Yeah, I, I've been in situations, and this also depends on whether this is an internal cost allocation or external. Yeah, our first budgeting process, actually, planning process, involved quite passionate discussions between the business heads, the product heads, yeah. and our yeah. own internal cost allocations. <laughs> and uh, this is where I, I brought up that topic with the internal cost allocations, that in the end, you know, the the way that those costs are allocated internally within mm. the, 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 the um, you know, is, is uh, uh, it is an important debate. But in the end, uh, you know, it's better not to have everybody debate uh, why they are getting this or that. What we did in that case, actually, is we had the, the function actually yeah. present their budget or their sort of, uh, you know, their, they present the budget, the, the plan to the business heads, all of them in one room. Yeah. And mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. say, okay, this is where we are now. This is what we are planning to do. Part of that is actually driven by these initiatives of yours. And that creates one session sort of for where it's not so much, well, I should be getting, you know, 12%, not 15. It would be a discussion of what is actually, as you rightly said, what are we paying for? What, what is that function? Yeah. And that opens up the discussion of how efficient it is, how well it yeah. serves the yeah. needs and so forth. But to me, it should not be a discussion of you know the percentage if it's internal yeah now if it's an external service providers if it's like your parent company allocating something to you that's where i said it be it becomes a bit political it it yeah. depends on how how much the the business is willing to challenge these things in the end you know that that is a bit of a different uh, uh yeah. i would say a game um and uh, but in yeah. the end it's also, uh, yeah. I would say, you're right. The the challenging process, uh, the challenging face is important everywhere. Yeah, nothing should be just accepted on its face value. It's always good to ask questions, especially if you see increases uh, when you know you don't you don't expect increases in costs should always be challenged. Personally, you know, I actually I I wasn't successful with this, but I was always driving actually that the starting point of the cost of the FTE budgeting, yeah, the compensation budgeting yeah, should be yeah. a 3% decrease at the high level. Why? Because there is attrition. Yeah. And I would say that, hey, this is where, you know, you are given, you're not a revenue function, yeah, but you are basically given a 3% to 5% lifestyle reduction in people. And if you are a good um, a professional, if you're a good expert in your function, you should be able to actually find um, automation or optimization opportunities to absorb yeah, yeah, the people yeah. that are living. Yeah. So this is how actually cost functions could become profit functions. And this is the best way. Mm -hmm. And I think we've been too lazy sort of in this construct where it's just, you know, just assume 3% increase. Why? You know, <laughs> The, uh, you know, you're not incentivizing the cost functions to actually think about efficiency, which they should always think about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The best I could do is basically convince some people at some point to kind of keep the compensation flat 
So where these reductions, natural sort of attritions mm -hmm. are basically absorbed. And then from there, you're able to increase compensation for the people that are picking up that work, you know, and that sort of works as an incentive. Um, but that is a that is an interesting conversation. But we also have just, you know, that week three to week five, there are, you will see in the words, there, there are places where you as an FP&A function, depending on your setup or through finance business partners, you would actually go back and also challenge the initiatives in case your business heads uh, are doing something funny with the revenues that could never happen. I mean, if they're hiring people first year, they already think they're going to have crazy revenues. You know, it would be a good uh, idea to push back on that and make sure it, these things are realistic. Yeah, I mean, everybody wants the money to hire people, uh, you know, and then it turns out that the, uh, the the projections are wildly unrealistic and you don't want to have that. So it should be a realistic view. And because that's part of the approval process, right? So uh, they approve a very good looking initiative, but it's nowhere near realistic. You just basically, I mean, you just spent money hiring people that are not going to benefit the organization. So that, that is a disservice to the organization, I would say. That's true. As long as we just don't have non-value adding discussions around allocation keys and um, internal yeah. allocation. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Right. I, I just isolate. I always isolate. I always, as soon as somebody would go in there, I said, you know, that is a separate discussion. And we would That's actually true. have a separate discussion. I never want it because that is where it gets very, very emotional very quickly. But in the end, it is a left pocket, right pocket. So from a business perspective, it is non-value adding discussion. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> if the costs are there, somebody will bear them. What are you gonna do? You <laughs> should question the costs, yeah, not the allocation. Okay. Thank you very much, Demi. Okay, thank you. One of the All things right. yeah. I say one of the things that uh, uh, we did in one company was, uh, and you alluded to it in terms of adding people, but we took into account the turnover and we got with HR and what's our turnover rate and realized that there was, uh, I, for, I forget now the percentage, it would vary a bit each, uh, each year, but it was maybe 1% of salary overall. And so the starting point wasn't base headcount and what their salaries are, it was that minus, we called it salary salvage, but we reduced it. The starting point was to reduce current staffing budget expense by one, two percent, just to allow for the normal turnover. Yeah, what you're talking about, that's actually an interesting point. Yeah, and we played around with this as well in the, uh, in the planning processes. The vacancy rate yeah because what happens is that usually you know no matter how much hiring you plan yeah you, you can never hire fast enough if you are actually diligent about hiring and at the same time you're always running a vacancy of probably five percent at least mm -hmm. yeah that every given time there's probably five percent absent and this is what actually the business tends to be able to manage a bit when they have to like they would freeze the hiring or they would you know de delay things right. and that just gives them they they are able to lock into that um you know temporary i would say uh, uh the turnover rate the the vacancy rate from the yeah. natural turnover and i would actually push it further as i i what i alluded to is i would actually i would set it as a target now personally as a head of fpna i didn't have the power to uh you know really <laughs> push the business to do that. But I think it's a good discussion to actually, uh, you know, uh, bring it up and say, you know what, we believe in finance that all, uh, you know, all functions should actually assume realistically that there is a turnover and not just assume that it will be basically there, but also assume that they should be able to um, capitalize on it and absorb it and generate cost savings for the company. This is a good way to think because everybody in the planning group always wants more money, right? And this is where I said about operating initiatives. This is how we would push back when they're suggesting something that is rather small. Thank you, James. Um, we would say, okay, can you find it? Can you absorb some costs? Can you find something to actually 
um, pay for these extra investments that you are looking for. And in half the time it was successful, but I do think it's a very good mindset, yeah? To kind of force people to think about absorbing costs and becoming more efficient over time, which everybody keeps talking about it, right? Everybody keeps saying, yeah, we got more efficient. We implemented this, we implemented, everybody keeps improving things, but somehow <laughs> it never translates in never any never shows up in the expenses yeah savings right yep. so but this is how you should be funding expansion so if you have a you know a general growth rate i would expect your expenses should be flat in sort of a minor growth scenario because there should be uh, efficiencies yeah and it's right. not firing people yeah i don't mean that i mean absorbing people who live through better processes and doing things just better you know no. there should be a constant uh, um, process improvement kind of happening uh, in the background one not to not to drag this out but i was uh like fpna had at a, a small or medium insurance company for a number of years in Philadelphia. And what we ended up doing was when I started, just what you described, you know, everybody spends their summer filling out sheets, getting angry with everybody. And um, and then at the end, the corporate actuarial would would look at the premium projections, run it against the allowables and say, well, here's the expense allowable this much and you want this much. So go back and go back and cut after everybody had gone through it. I, I reversed that order. And typically, you know, you'd start with marketing. Okay. What can you do next year? All right. See what that generates. Okay. This is what we have to work with. If we're going to make our plan, our plan targets, and um, and then you know I alluded to what we did with salary, and you mentioned the uh, the what the the building the building cost the uh, occupancy cost those things you know the HR or the real estate department they tell you what that is they're going to tell you what the phone what the phones are going to be and. All, so many of the line items, we just we just did that on our spreadsheet, preloaded, and gave that to the business unit people, and we gave them their salaries for current headcount, and then there was an overall target, and many years it was flat, you know, and so you figure out how to get there, but and any new program expenses, again, figure out looking at your running rates, looking looking at uh, uh, any uh, any baseline shifts, how you're going to get there and make it work. And so it was uh, it was a it was the process was a you know a different kind of process when pe once people got used to it, much more uh, respectful of people's time, all of all of our time. and the end product and the discussions around it were were, a lot different and you know came out with a better product exactly yeah and that's exactly what i was also communicating and that's what happened with us when, when you know i that's why i emphasize it so much it's it's it, you know it, it was always a bit of a sort of uh, debate in some companies who is really responsible for it it was not a debate with me uh, when i you know when i took over the fpna department for the first time I said, it's my responsibility. I will run the whole thing yeah, and I will calculate everything uh, for you so you don't have to bother. And we're going to only approach you for things where you are the expert. Everything else we will provide to you in a reasonable format. I mean, in the end, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter if it's like off by a little bit, but at least it's right. reasonable. At least it's consistent. Right. And you have it there. And then the discussion moves very quickly. And now you're talking strategically. Do you still have gaps, you know, to your targets or whatever? Uh, you know, is it ambitious enough? Um, are people basically sort of being, uh, you know, uh, wanting too much and sort of not being uh, good team players? Uh, you know, you, you talk about business. 
you have, a, you have a you have a business discussion and not a yeah. numbers discussion. Not numbers discussion. Exactly right. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, I'm going to step yeah. in here. Um, we do need this the Zoom room for another meeting coming up, so I do need to ask you to wrap it up. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. No. Thank you very much. I think uh, I think we are done. Yeah. Um, so thank, thank you. Thank you for organizing this, Laurie. No problem. Yeah. And um, Dean, if you want to send the uh, your uh, presentation to Charlotte, she can get it out out to everybody, and we will post the yes. uh, recording on YouTube. Okay. Very well. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Uh, we Take care. And please uh, you, come everyone. back to me if you like um, to discuss further. Thank you. And uh, Marilyn as well. And everybody, thank you. Bye. Bye.